I'm Tara. And I'm Jim, and this is Feature Bang. The podcast where two amateur writers do mainstream reviews of adult films. Due to the subject matter, this podcast is for adults only. Our film today is Marriage 2.0. It is directed by Paul Deeb. It stars India Summer and Ryan Driller. When did uh, when did this movie come out? Oh, good question. This movie came out in 2015. 2015. So this is not a vintage offering. This is a hot, spicy, contemporary meatball that we are handling here. It sure is. So let's get right into it. Our protagonist is a San Francisco journalist named India, played by actor India Summer, as I mentioned. The film begins with a scene where India's crew is preparing an interview for a documentary about polyamory called Marriage 2.0. There are two people being interviewed, spouses Chris Ryan and Casilda Jetta, who play themselves in the film. Just a little background, in real life as in the movie, Ryan and Jetta co-authored a 2010 book about polyamory. The book is called Sex at Dawn. And when this book dropped in real life, it was a hit. It was a New York Times bestseller. It was lauded in popular media. I'm currently reading it right now, actually. I'm about 100 pages in. It got mixed reviews in academia, but I like the book. Uh, The thesis is that it's incorrect to think that we human beings are quote-unquote naturally monogamous, like some evolutionary psychologists claim. Furthermore, it argues that monogamy is difficult since it isn't hardwired into us. It's just a really challenging cultural restraint. And in keeping with that thesis, the book is still very popular with polyamorous people, those in open relationships, uh, and such relationships are a main focus of this film. Now, listeners, if you're wondering if this film is going to be a vehicle for the ideas presented in this book... Uh, and feature the book heavily, I'm going to ask you to reserve judgment on that. Let's not make assumptions. So with that in mind, uh, the film shows a crew setting up the Chris Ryan, Casilda Jetta interview. India's getting ready. Ryan and Jetta are quietly arguing about there being a film crew in their house. Uh, They begin the the interview with Chris Ryan detailing some of his arguments in Sex at Dawn, and interspersed throughout this interview footage are shots of India's life away from work. We see India in bed with her partner, Eric. We see her morning routine. It looks like they've got a nice place, maybe like a condo or at least a very nice apartment. Uh, Things seem very good at home. We see the first of many jogging scenes in front of the Golden Gate Bridge, India having her morning jog with the iconic landmark in the background, which will be featured numerous times throughout the film. Yeah, the film is definitely, uh, in part, a love story to San Francisco uh, as as much as anything else. There's uh, a lot of banter early on about the nature of monogamy. Monogamy gets compared to vegetarianism. I found it interesting because I feel like the reason that you would choose to be or not be monogamous is very different than some of the reasons you might choose or not choose to be vegetarian. So, really powerful metaphors. Right, yeah. yeah. Chris Ryan, uh, I listen to Chris Ryan's podcast. I like Chris Ryan a lot. Um, Like I said, the the book did get a little academic criticism, and some of Chris Ryan's arguments are like that. He'll, I, I think partly he does stuff like that to make his work seem more accessible and less academic. So he'll say, oh, it's like vegetarianism. It's a cultural constraint, you know, stuff like that. Um, I think it's, I think people are going to relate to that rather than him talking about like the sociological and anthropological concepts of enforced monogamy and stuff like that. But uh, after the interview, India gets home. Her partner, Eric, is cooking dinner. They discuss some career frustrations, and then they get right to having sex in the kitchen, letting the food burn. There's lots of wine involved, both in the cooking and in the sex, prior to the sex. It is California, so, you know, they're probably drinking some pretty good wine. I like that he's, like, he's drinking a glass and he just, like, dumps it into whatever he's cooking. Eric is very, uh, he's very devil may care that way. Like, Eric does Eric. Also, I didn't know his name for a lot of the film. Fun fact. So in my notes, he's just stubble guy because Eric is rocking a five o'clock shadow the whole film. Like he is so dedicated to that exact level of stubble that I wonder how he has time to do anything else. 
So you didn't know his name for a lot of the film. I didn't know his personality for a lot of the film. He is sort of nonchalant and cavalier. I don't really get much of a sense of him as a character. Uh, We could probably talk about that more as we go on. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of wine in this movie. Spoiler alert. There is a ton of wine. I was expecting to see sponsored by California Vineyard Association. (laughs) Most of the characters are winos in this film, and this is a wine-soaked feature. I want to point out, uh, the while activity is heating up in the kitchen, concurrently you see, like, water bubbling over. Like, whatever is on the stove, you're just watching. It's it's almost the equivalent of, like, pistons pumping or a geyser <laughs> going off. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit on the nose, isn't it? Well, it's on the something. It's on the open flame of the stove. <laughs> Of course, that causes a problem because uh, as they're having sex in the kitchen, the food is burning. And so a nosy neighbor, Mrs. Peters, played by real life sexologist Carol Queen, comes bursting into their condo and she makes the excuse, well, I smelled smoke. So of course I barged in. She, but loves, Eric- she loves to barge in. She's always <laughs> look, you got like, you get the sense that she is a hundred percent like hoping these kids will do something so she can barge in and catch them in the act. That is absolutely the sense I got from Mrs. Peters. She's very voyeuristic, but everybody's, like, playful and tongue-in-cheek about it. It's very gentle. Yeah, it's it's a very lighthearted moment. Indy and Eric actually mentioned that they should probably change the locks on their doors because she does this all the time, so... <laughs> they do! <laughs> so, yeah. The rest of the first act of the film is an exploration of what's going well in the relationship. And Eric and India have a sweet, relaxed comfort together. They go on little pleasant outings and dates to wine country and the beach. And by showing us what's right in the relationship, the film is setting up an expectation, I think, that something is about to go wrong. It can't stay this idyllic forever. Can I just talk about the way that that is constructed? Because one thing that you'll notice very quickly about this film is there are lots and lots of just fast cuts between scenes. Like, almost sometimes a character, they won't even have completed their line of dialogue and then we're in another scene. And we get this montage of just a bunch of different kind of a la carte clips of, as you say... India and Eric having a lovely time, nothing could go wrong, these two people have absolutely no chemistry, but whatever, they're happy, they're drinking wine, they have their beautiful chateaus that they're hanging out at. It's very California. Just, if you had any doubt that this film was set in California, that gets thoroughly put to rest. If you've never heard of the Golden Gate Bridge, fear not, this movie will still index Californian identity to you at every opportunity. Can we talk about an anecdote that Eric relates? Like, because he's an artist, and he makes, uh, I don't think we ever see it, but we're told he makes some subversive art, and his latest piece is, uh, it's got, I... I believe, bunnies and vaginas all over it. And he tells an anecdote that he and his friend, when they were kids, believed that naked women lived at the center of the earth. And so they tried to dig a hole in the backyard, and they quickly realized they were not going to get to the center of the earth. So Eric's friend kindly dressed up as a girl and allowed Eric to feel up his breasts. And that was the basis for the piece. And this is just a little bit of the insight we... I don't know why you would ever say Eric is not a character when we have this delightful anecdote right off the bat to uh, disabuse our listeners of that notion. (laughs) You know, like, uh, maybe we should talk about this more. Like, clearly the function of the writers putting that anecdote in there is to try to give Eric some characterization. He was pretty cardboardy to me. I I think what we know about him is he's creative and he's kind of cavalier. And that's kind of it. He's, like, supposedly creative. He, he definitely puts, like, I am a maker on his Instagram profile, for sure. As a person, though, he is... I'm just, I don't want to spoil this, but I hate him the most out of everyone in this film, and I dislike a lot of people in this film, so take that as you will. With India, I don't think her characterization is extensive either. I mean, we, we certainly see she's organized and regimented because we've seen her morning routine, we've seen her job... She cares a lot about the relationship, 
that's the best that we know about her too. I think the characterization is a problem. I'll, I'll start right off the bat with that. Like as we explore the relationship between India and Eric, it's tougher to care about what happens to the two characters vis-a-vis -vis their relationship since the characters aren't defined enough or three-dimensional enough or fleshed out enough. There's just not enough characterization in the movie to give us a sense of who these people are. And without knowing who these people are in depth, it's tough to feel something about their relationship, at least for me. That was, my, that was what I took away. They're not super reactive to anything, including each other at first. So after the montage... We cut to them out on the road somewhere. They're just somewhere with their car. It's the first time that we get a long moment of dead silence in the movie. There are a number of sequences throughout the film where there's just extended dead silence. That sound just cuts out abruptly, often when it seems like it shouldn't, often when the character's lips are moving and we hear nothing. What do you think the effect of that is supposed to be, or at least the reason why it's in the film? Because I have a theory about that. I have a very prosaic take on that, which is the same as my take on the rapid cuts between moments. Like many films of this genre, this is reaching for art and dramatic silence is definitely artsy. I do have a theory on that, and I want to get to it towards the end of our review, because I think there's a very specific production reason why the sound is the way that it is, by which I mean absent abruptly <laughs> a lot of the time. But there's a specific scene that I think illustrates it better than this, so I want to save it for that. I have some sound woes with this. Like, the silence is the least of it. There are times where silence almost would have been more effective. You're completely right. Let me just say this, and I say this as somebody that has done some sound engineering in the past. I wanted to like the sound engineering. Um, it was quite bad. Like, there will be times when a character is cut off, like you mentioned, and they're speaking. There's not much in the way of music. The mixing, the sound effects are off the volume of the character's voices. It's sometimes tough to hear precisely what they say over ambient noise or background conversation. And let me tell you, you are on the edge of your seat to find out what they're going to say next. <laughs> sound design, resplendently bad. So next scene, we get the first hint of conflict. India tells Eric she's going to make reservations for a weekend date she's planning with him. He reminds her that he's busy that weekend because he's taking out Kara, the other woman he's been seeing. We get the reveal that this is a polyamorous relationship. With a big asterisk. It's an open relationship with some caveats and some complications. Very much so. Uh, do you want to go into those? One thing that becomes apparent relatively quickly is that India does not know Kara. Kara is just a name. Up to this point in the film, India is intrigued by Sex at Dawn, the concepts presented in the book at the center of the movie. She seems passive and aloof to the openness in her own relationship, and right now she seems to me to be a bit avoidant of what that means for their relationship, what that does to her emotionally. She's kind of non-reactive to it, but man, don't tell your main chick that you're going out with your side chick when she's trying to, like, organize a hot spring date for you. Like, that's just, come on. There's bad communication between these two. They, they are immediately breaking some of the cardinal rules of open relationships, I think. Are you aware, because perhaps I don't know as much about this as you do, is it a cardinal rule that you have to meet the other person's partners? No, not at all. But I think that in this case, the initial vibe that one gets is that India is kind of going along with this, and it is definitely more Eric who is pushing for non-monogamy at this point, and um, that doesn't generally end well. They're not on the same page about it, and they're not at the same level of comfort about it, for sure. India immediately gets jealous about Eric seeing Kara, um, who is a younger woman, and she puts a twinge of resentment into the question, oh, how old is Kara now? 28? And uh, I give India Summer some credit for her line delivery there because it's just resentful enough to be like plausibly deniable as a, like a passive aggressive statement. And yet at the same time is clearly a passive aggressive statement. 
she could totally but like what no i'm just curious gosh i can't ask questions about the woman you're seeing on the side come on india summer being older than 28 she's just putting so fine a point on it india by the way looks like she is the wizened old age of maybe 34 let me look it up she was 40 Certainly not old, but certainly not 28 either. And oh, So how old is Kara now? 28? Just kind of digging in a little bit. And so we see the indication of India being jealous. We see the first cracks in their relationship that was initially presented to us as if it was ideal. And yet India and Eric do have a communication issue and an issue of Eric doing what he wants, but India not really being comfortable with the openness uh, in their relationship. Now, to be fair, Eric does say, well, aren't you seeing Jeremy this weekend? Like, India does have other partners, at least one other partner, Jeremy. And we never see Jeremy throughout the film. He's not mentioned again. But I do think it's important to know that it's not just that Eric is the only one who is going outside of the dyad in their relationship. Like, they, they are both seeing other people. Can I just say that when you describe the cracks in the relationship, I immediately envision, like, the most generic old country buffet white plate with a crack in it? It's an otherwise featureless plate. Like, the crack in their relationship is the most interesting thing about their relationship. Very much agreed. And partly that's because of, and I go back to it, the, the characterization. Like, if we were heavily invested in these two people as people, if we were heavily invested in them as characters, we as viewers would be more heavily invested in their relationship and would, I think, read more into it. Uh, but but uh, it is sort of flat in that way. Cut to Chris Ryan and Casilda Jetta. Chris is discussing how monogamy is socially constructed and that historically even so-called monogamous men still had mistresses. Uh, and in other words, social pressure to be monogamous was meant to curtail just women's behavior and not men's. Can we, uh, can we pause for a moment? Because he says a lot about things that are social constructs. One of the things that he defines as a social <laughs> construct was PMS. Uh, pre-menstrual suckage is the official scientific term, um, which was news to me. I wasn't, I didn't know that the uh, sort of change in mood and just your sense of physical well-being was a social construct. Well, I actually agree with him. Uh, maybe we should talk about this. And maybe there's, maybe there's a point of difference between us. And let, let me just say, there's a book that I would recommend on this topic. There's a few books that I would recommend about this topic. Um, one of them is a book called Crazy Like Us by Ethan Waters that talks about how we treat certain medical conditions, particularly ones that affect psychology and mood. And he doesn't mention PMS in particular, but there is certainly a biological component to it, but how that gets expressed um, and how that gets codified and compartmentalized is very much socially constructed to the point in which the United States and the so-called West tends to export its disorders, including its is you know seemingly purely biological disorders out to the rest of the world you know something like schizophrenia where you know it you know seems like it should be uh, a matter of you know, amount of dopamine in someone's uh, reward pathway in the brain given research into schizophrenia among other things uh, so it, it should be strictly biological right there should have been schizophrenic cavemen for instance that we would call schizophrenic it shouldn't be culturally constructed right and he'll go in detail how what we call schizophrenia is so different in various other cultures and additionally that in some places it would not even be seen as a disorder but rather as someone that talks with the spirits or someone that talks with the ancestors uh, there's another book called the spirit catches you and you fall down that's about epilepsy as a social construct and you think epilepsy like there's neuroscience behind it how is that a social construct and it talks about the Hmong people and how epilepsy is seen as almost shamanic and it's holy and it's religious and when a Hmong person comes to the united states as in with the book uh it's nonfiction. 
um, when a, a Hmong child comes to the United States who has epilepsy and Western medicine and neuroscience try to intervene in order to treat her epilepsy, because of the uh, cultural circumstance that she's in, her health actually deteriorates because for the Hmong people, their treatment, their cultural construction of epilepsy is adaptive for them and has been historically. And so when they get into an imposed Western medicalized setting where you would expect one's health to improve, uh, the, the child's health with epilepsy uh, actually deteriorates. So yeah, I, I do think, uh, I agree fully with Chris Ryan. Um, that I, I kind of don't want to get too dissertation-y about this. There's another book called The Social Construction of What by Ian Hacking that talks about much of this. Yeah, I think even the so-called biological disorders are themselves, I don't want to say fully socially constructed. There is an objective biological component to them, but how the behaviors that they manifest actually obtain is itself socially constructed and the course of the condition is socially constructed and its place in society, the labels that are put onto it. So yeah, I could imagine very much that there are probably cultures in which even though obviously predominantly women there are menstruating, they may not have what we call PMS because the uh, what Ethan Waters calls the symptom pool, which is the set of behaviors from which we externalize our distress, that symptom pool is different depending on the culture that you're in. And so therefore the ways in which your biology will manifest emotionally and behaviorally is quite different. So I, I imagine there probably are cultures that have no PMS. I think I am operating on a different definition of PMS than has been <laughs> classically accepted. Like, I agree the image of the weeping, hysterical, female assigned at birth person uh, that's the picture we've been presented with for a long time, and I absolutely do not buy into the, like, all women and all people who menstruate need chocolate and sappy movies, and, like, there's the old joke of, at least in the United States, like, oh, a woman couldn't be president because one week out of the month they'd start wars. That's bullshit. I guess when I think of PMS, I have a little bit more of a 2020 take on it, which is, that's just, like, how I know my period is coming, because... I feel like shit. And it's not a psychological thing. It's like, oh, fuck this again. Okay. All right. Here it comes. And I, it's not the, I don't know that it is the version of PMS that is discussed in that literature so much it is, as it is just the body gearing up to expel tissues and such that it no longer requires. So that's all I meant. I guess my view on all of that is, like, I don't regard it with a lot of mystique, the whole cycle, but I also kind of respect that it does cause changes in at least my body over time uh, that I notice. So that that is where the, the dissonance between what the book was in the movie was presented. And this is a this is a long digression. I think it's a digression worth having. They, the movie the movie definitely got me thinking about it by calling PMS a social construct, and I, I see what you're saying. I also see how it could be a little bit invalidating to people who do experience what they term as that, you know, whether they regard it as a disease or just a perfectly acceptable and natural part of having a hormonal cycle and, you know, constant change in the body, which all of us experience regardless of our, our gender or biological makeup, so... That was what I was thinking, but I understand the term PMS has a pretty loaded history, and it sounds like people have explored that extensively, which is great. Yeah. So, like, obviously, you're the resident expert here on PMS. I don't uh, I don't pretend to be able to speak with any type of authority on it uh, in the way that you can. I'm curious to know if you were part of a culture that revered a woman's period. Do you think that you would have psychologically developed in such a way that you would feel as shitty? Yes, and I'm going to tell you why. And this is gross. Okay. This is gross. Okay. It's because periods <laughs> literally make you shitty. I, I will take your authority on that, and uh, I will- I will. Look, buddy, uh, there's a lot of muscles cramping and squeezing down there. It is not good. Like, it takes- you gotta, you know, you're, you're you're wringing that stuff out of your uterus. There's some other uh, organs that are gonna get involved, and uh, it's just not, you know. I am so happy. I am so happy that we live in a world 
where we can treat ourselves with respect. We don't need to vilify the period. We don't need to make it gross. And if people want to revere it, and if people are moved to revere it, and, and that is organic for them culturally, I would love to experience that. I can't actually imagine what that would be like. But being familiar with the basic procedure of having a period, I gotta say... There are other things I would revere first, like having uh, thumbs. Thumbs are great. Like, thumbs are way cooler than periods. Thumbs, they don't cramp unless maybe you're a little dehydrated or you tweaked your wrist. They don't make you poop a lot, generally. You can't wrestle with periods. You could totally thumb wrestle. You can thumb wrestle. Um, periods are great. I am not trying to menstrual shame. I am in awe of what the human body can do. People of all genders who have uteruses have a really fucking cool organ in their body. It is a big step for me to imagine revering the process of eliminating the uterine lining and all of the uh, associated things that happen. I defer to your uh, authority on that issue and the way that you have described it. Anyway, marriage 2.0. We then meet India's mom, played by veteran actor Nina Hartley. She is hooking up with a much younger man, younger even than India. India calls her mom, says she's stressed out and that she wants to talk. She goes to her mom's place. She runs into the younger guy and she's all like, mom, like clearly a recurring thing for them. Do not milf shame. Be happy for your mom. Yeah, actually, I, that, that was my feeling as well. Like, what was her irritation? I guess her irritation is like, I think we know that India as a character is self-conscious about her age and the men are younger than her that her mom is hooking up with. I still say like more power to her. You know what I mean? I don't, you know, I'm not against May-December relationships. Like more power to India's mom, who doesn't get a name in the film, unfortunately. But uh, you're right. I wish India would identify with her mom here and really, uh, really be supportive. They kick the young hot guy out. We never get a name for him, and he's kind of summarily dismissed, and they go have mimosas out on the deck. Meanwhile, cut to Eric. Whereas India is seeking support from her mom, Eric is seeking support from Kara, the other woman. This is the first time that we get to see Kara. Um, Eric is doing a little bit of painting. He calls her up. He's looking for that support, but Kara is not interested in giving it, really. She tells Eric that she can't fix his relationship problems and that maybe India only sees other men because Eric wants an open relationship and not because she does. What? No. No. I'll bet India is the one who suggested this whole thing. <laughs> you think? I mean, it is something they could have just like talked about as a couple. Really, predominantly, I put this on Eric's shoulders. I mean, both of them could have brought it up at some point in the relationship, but it does bug me that Eric isn't considerate enough to care what India really wants here and just wants his polyamory to work out. Nothing against polyamory, but any like anybody would tell you it takes better communication than this. Eric definitely prioritizes himself. Yes. In this open relationship, uh, which is a recipe for a failed polyamorous relationship. So Kara tells Eric that she enjoys his company, but she's not okay with being the other woman. And I wanted to ask you, because I had a few different interpretations of this, what do you think Kara means that she doesn't want to be the other woman? Like, what in specific is her objection there? I kind of took it as Kara wants this to be as uncomplicated as possible. And I think what she is saying to Eric in that moment is that in order for her to keep seeing him in good faith, he has to make sure that he's right with his own partner because the other woman implies an affair. You know, she's not saying, I don't want to be your secondary partner. She's saying, I do not want to be your mistress. And I think that in that moment, she's actually looking out for India a little bit. Like, Kara is not here to be a homewrecker. She's here with the understanding that she is consenting to be involved in a communicative, open relationship where the partners are on the same page. I think that is what she means by that. Also, it's worth noting, she lives on a boat. <laughs> oh, she lives in a really cool barge. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we can discuss that more, but... Uh, 
Yeah, I, I had a similar interpretation. Um, I didn't take it as Kara wants a higher level of intimacy and commitment with Eric so much. I took it as she's uncomfortable about being part of India's suffering. Which is cool. Eric, by this point, I was feeling he has not really justified the relationship he has with these two women. I am not sure what either of them are getting out of it. Other than some of the obvious physical attributes that, you know, you see why this guy was hired for the film. It was not his ability to portray a compassionate partner who just accidentally blunders into a relationship faux pas. Like, he is a, a selfish jerk, and I don't understand how he made two women want to be with him. to the conversation with India and her mom, this is actually kind of a touching moment. Like, this is a very real and sincere conversation. Her mom talks about how she has reclaimed her sexuality from her grief after India's dad died. And I think that that's really powerful. India's a little skeptical of her mother's proclivities, but the fact is, is that her mom, who I'm sad is nameless, has really taken ownership of her sexuality in a situation where she could have very easily cut herself off from that aspect of her life. She tells a really cute anecdote India's mom does about getting a uh, shit face drunk with grandma, and grandma just implores mom to just please enjoy men. This is mom's origin story, how she became the powerful MILF that she is. Her mom expresses concern that India maybe isn't really cut out for this open relationship with Eric, but uh, ultimately just encourages to explore what India herself wants. And I think that that scene, I think that's my favorite scene in the film. And I really enjoyed that encounter with India's mom. Very much the same. In these few minutes of screen time, we get more characterization for India's mom than we've gotten for India or Eric throughout the entire movie so far. We see multiple sides of her. We see a libidinous, zest for life side of her. We see that she is someone that has struggled with grief and pain. We see somebody that sort of envisions a life where she could have just closed herself off and missed out on the good things in life, but instead decided to open up and take risks again after having been hurt by the loss of her husband. And she's so much happier for it, and she wants India to at least be open to trying things that would show her what she really wants in life and what could make her happy too, um, at least to learn you know, what she, uh, what she wants and what she doesn't want. Finding out that you don't like something is valid as long as you try of your own consent and then you can stop when you can do not consent any longer to participate like i think it's absolutely great to explore in that way and i think mom gives good advice and i would absolutely have apple teenies with mom like i would go out on the town with mom <laughs> i don't think that me and india would be friends but me and india's mom would kick it oh all day can you imagine the stories all, all day, day. I love all her. day i would hang out with india's mom and nina hartley's acting is quite good by the way it's really uh, i would call it the second strongest performance in the film and i'll get to who i think is the first later Ooh. uh so moving on. We get another shot of jogging by the Golden Gate Bridge. And who do you think India passes? Who does she end up uh, jogging with? I couldn't possibly guess. What other sexy minx do we know about in this film that might be out getting her fitness on by the Golden Gate Bridge? It's Kara. Yeah, I think Eric's got a thing for joggers. When he meets women, do you, do you jog by the Golden Gate Bridge by any chance? <laughs> he just waits by the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> he's, that, he's that bridge creeper. He's like the, the modern day troll. He just lives under the bridge. No, because that would make him too interesting. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they they have kind of an interesting little competitive scene. Um, they Because they've never met, they don't know that they are both the lover and partner of Eric, respectively. So it's this just pure moment of competitiveness between two people who are just out enjoying themselves. Uh, and I like that that's how they meet, ultimately. I like that they kind of meet inadvertently on, on their own terms, almost. Yeah, doing an activity that they mutually enjoy. 
Up next is a scene. I'm gonna... Maybe you should introduce it, but I have a lot to say about this scene that follows. Okay. India is having lunch with her friends. They're discussing relationship pitfalls and debating the utility of marriage. Much of this is just right out of the text of Sex at Dawn. Uh, India says that she is now thinking, having talked with her mom, maybe some openness might be good for long-term relationships and... One of her friends suggests that India go to a swingers dinner party hosted by a polyamorous couple that her friends know. Uh, So India resolves to go there with Eric. Uh, what, What was your take on this scene? So many layers to this scene. So this is where we really get into the weeds with some of the sound issues in the film. This whole scene is, like, I envisioned just one microphone in a room full of brunching Californians. Most of the dialogue is inaudible. We get some riveting, like, food ordering action. Like, we we watch them order their little brunches. And then you literally have, like, I don't want to say devil and angel because I don't think it's that kind of dichotomy. But India is literally sitting between a married woman who thinks monogamy is the way to go. And then her friend, who I believe is named Athena. I called her faux hawk girl because she has kind of a faux mohawk thing going on. She's very supportive of non-monogamy, and she's a little bit condescending to India. She's, you know, she's like, oh, what are you going to do, like, a bunch of yoga to fill your life with meaning? She very much presents monogamy as, like, the bland vanilla option and not just a choice that a person might make for themselves, you know, maybe for cultural reasons, maybe for personal reasons. Athena's point of view is that it's just the wrong way to go. So India kind of is in the middle of this argument between two people, but boy, I just, I can't overstate how muddy the audio is and how much it's like, you hear the way that I'm talking right now. I have a fairly low affect West Coast accent. And when I hear that talking about like lecturing someone about polyamory, I, it just, it hits too close to home. I have been at that party, girl. I have talked to these people. It's like, yeah, just like, why would you eat only sushi? Like monogamy (laughs) is just like eating sushi all the time. And like, sometimes you like ice cream, like the sushi can't meet all of your needs. And I don't want to get into, I'm not going to make fun of like how people on the West coast talk because that's how I talk. But this is not well delivered in any sense, and so the affect, the, f- the relatively flat affect of the actors here kind of just made it grating to listen to on a very deeply personal level. Um, that has absolutely nothing to do with my own self-consciousness about how I talk. Why would you ever say that? <laughs> it's a, I mean, it's all good. Uh, I'm trying to think what the East Coast equivalent of that conversation would be like. It would, <laughs> I think it would be very confrontational. I mean, not that this wasn't, but it would be more like... Uh, what are you going soft? You're gonna settle down with one person? Like, what are you gonna do here? You know, it'd be it'd be one of those things. Like, you what's the matter with you? Huh? That is so much more animated than this discussion. And like, no one stops to order. Like, I w- w- no one stops to order brunch in the middle of it. You know, like it's such a tedious scene. And it, the reason that I'm coming down on it so hard is because it's one of many scenes where they are the, the movie is really trying to drive its thesis home through this dialogue, and I found myself more annoyed by the sound and the delivery of the characters, and I could not really internalize the message of the film. It was tedious. Um, I didn't catch a name for her, but I like Athena better than Fohawk Girl, so I'll call her Athena. She's real edgy. She's real, like, I'm not afraid to be in your face, but it is delivered in that uptalk inflection. I wonder... Oh, actually, no, I don't have to wonder because they talk about how they met. These are college friends who have had all kinds of crazy adventures together throughout their lives. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, that much does come through. I would say. So I can see why they're friends, but, uh, you know, it's a little debate. Partly it is stilted because, like I said, it could be taken directly from the text of Sex at Dawn. Like, these are some of the arguments that Sex at Dawn makes, the book. It's sort of a rehash of that, which is appropriate because the film is as much a love story to Sex at Dawn as it is to San Francisco.
So we cut to the swinger party. There is this swinger party, yeah. The swingers group, they have a bougie dinner, there's hors d'oeuvres, there's yet more wine. Thousands of grapes had to die for the making of this film. Like, you'll see wine throughout. Pour one out for the grapes. (laughs) So they're at the dinner party, they make their introductions to the hosts, and then Kara happens to show up. And- Listeners, forgive us if we keep using Kara and Kara interchangeably. The audio in the film isn't so great, and uh, I'm not sure that the film is consistent itself. I'm going to level with you that any inconsistency on my part is purely because my name is Tara, and there is a similar Tara-Tara dichotomy. I respond to both, personally, and I assume the Kara-Karas of the world are in a similar position, but I apologize if you are a Kara or a Kara or anyone in between and our inconsistency of pronunciation has has troubled you in any way. Kara happens to show up. Everybody's like, hi, Kara. And India immediately concludes based on just the first name that this Kara is the Kara that Eric has been <laughs> sleeping with. And she's right. So Kara and India get formally introduced to each other for the first time, and it's super awkward. It's very like, uh, oh, nice to meet you through clenched teeth. They talk each other up in a way that suggests that there is some discomfort and maybe even hostility. In my notes, I describe it as anti-negging. They talk each other up in such a way that it makes it very clear that they're not actually comfortable with each other. It it is a very passive sort of, it's not like, none of them are being direct at all about their discomfort or about the awkwardness. And there is a sort of subtle shade being cast throughout even when they're being outwardly nice, seeming to each other. After dinner, India talks to Megan, the hostess of the swingers party, and India says, yeah, this isn't what I expected at all. You swingers all seem put together, you know, implying that she had a stigma about swingers. And Megan says, basically, every couple there has had their ups and downs. They may seem put together, but nobody's perfect, and relationships are hard no matter what form that they take, monogamous or otherwise. Uh, And Megan then takes India through a tour of various rooms of the house. They go on a little safari. (laughs) (laughs) They go room by room and view uh, the swingers having sex, and ultimately, India walks in on Eric and Kara. It's an intense moment. India sees this, and she is not ready to relinquish her feelings of envy, her feelings of hurt. Actually seeing Eric in the act with Kara, Kara, is pretty hurtful for her. India watches the completion of Eric and Kara Kara's uh, sex act, and the couple, Eric and India, they exchange a, a pretty loaded look as as Kara Kara finishes up and then we cut away We cut to the Chris Ryan interview where he's talking about jealousy being natural. He says even non-human animals feel something akin to what we would call jealousy, but that sexual jealousy in particular can't be understood without considering it as a cultural construct. And that segues to India and Eric at home arguing as a function of this kind of jealousy. There's a seething tension between them. It blows up. India accuses Eric of going beyond just sex and actually being in love with Kara. I love his reaction to this because he's like, no, it's not love. Well, okay, actually, maybe it is love, but it's, it's the stupid kind. It's the dumb kind of love that doesn't mean anything. He quickly goes from total denial to yes with caveats to just why can't I have my cake and eat it too? I'll quote him directly. He actually says, yeah, it's love. But it's not love, love. <laughs> so Super unhelpful, Eric. What do words even mean? If you think about it, what even are they? <laughs> uh, so India kicks him out of her place. Eric is now homeless. Oh no, poor guy. We cut to pensive shot of the old breakup marina. Uh, Eric has decided to pay a visit to Kara's boat. I'm just gonna go with Kara. I'm sorry, Kara's. 
This is not meant to alienate you. I just, it rhymes with my name. Um, he goes to Kara's boat and is like, hey, can I, like, I was thinking maybe, like, uh, I could, like, crash here for a while. And Kara's like, it's not even like that, man. It is not even, you can hang out. <laughs> yeah, it ain't even all that. And then at one point it cuts to a little dialogue exchange where Eric compares himself to Odysseus and Kara is just the siren tempting him away. Like, way to offload all responsibility for your own behavior onto the women who, for whatever reason, are tolerating you, Eric. Just well fucking done. Well, also, it's such an ill-informed comparison. Like, Eric talks like somebody that has read a blurb about the Odyssey and hasn't read the Odyssey. Like, he's saying that he himself, Eric, is Odysseus, India is Penelope, and as a means of trying to appeal to Kara and get her to understand his situation, he compares her to the sirens. He compares Kara to the sirens while trying to empathize with her concern about being, quote, the other woman. So apparently Eric is unaware that the sirens were trying to kill Odysseus. That it's just <laughs> such a weird, it's such a bad comparison and doesn't help his case and really betrays that he probably hasn't read the Odyssey at all. I think maybe, if I'm being charitable, maybe Eric has played Assassin's Creed Odyssey and that might be... <laughs> <laughs> the closest he's ever got to that lore. I mean, I know we're supposed to believe he is a sensitive artist type, and we even see him painting. Like, the film is really trying to convince us of his artsiness, but I don't buy it, and this really drives home that this is not a character who is well-read or who has much of a like interesting context for any of his behaviors. So... Kara tells Eric that he and India need to co-coordinate the balance in their open relationship. Like, no shit, Sherlock, but this is the first time that Eric is really getting this talk. Rather than Eric just determining the balance and just wanting India to be okay with the balance that he has chosen. Well, that doesn't sound very good for Eric. I mean, have you considered Eric's feelings in any of this? <laughs> Poor Eric. He's homeless. He's having an argument with, quote unquote, the other woman on her really awesome barge that he'd really like to stay with. Probably not just because he's homeless, but it's a cool barge. It is legit amazing. I like Kara. She's like, hell no. <laughs> he compares her to the sirens, but in a good way. It, it's like him saying, it is love, but it's not love, love. Like, no, you don't understand. You're like the sirens, girl. Like, as, <laughs> as a compliment. And then Kara tells him, what he needs to hear, and uh, I think Eric really does need to not be quite so self-absorbed about the whole thing. Um, meanwhile, we see the impact on India. India goes for yet another jog, and we see the Golden Gate Bridge, but this time, this time, it is shrouded in fog. It is the symbolic fog of open relationship conflict, and our characters don't know what way to go. They don't know what to do. They are deep in their own interpersonal conflicts here. And appropriately, the Golden Gate Bridge is obscured by this fog that has rolled into the Bay Area, which I thought was hilarious. I don't know if it's intentional, but it was such a heavy-handed visual metaphor that I had to put it in my notes. Meanwhile, India is distracted at work due to the falling out with Eric. She's still interviewing Chris Ryan, who, sensing that India's having a problem, offers to reschedule the interview with her. And they have a heart-to-heart, -heart, they, Chris Ryan and India, have a heart-to-heart -heart about how difficult relationships can be. And I need to say, Chris Ryan crushes this performance. I am in love with Chris Ryan's performance here. Chris Ryan is not an actor. He has a PhD in psychology. He's a podcaster and sometime author. Um, he's not an actor, but he is so natural here. He was so natural in having a heart-to-heart -heart about how hard relationships can be with India that I questioned whether or not this was completely ad-libbed. Turns out it was scripted or semi-scripted. Actually, the end credits have scenes of Chris Ryan being directed and such. Like This was not Chris Ryan out of character. This is Chris Ryan in character acting so natural that it seems like he's not acting at all. And I'll mention for this performance and undoubtedly because of this scene, Chris Ryan received, I don't know if you know this, Tara, Chris Ryan received an AVN award for his acting here. That's fantastic. I think acting as yourself, that's got to be a huge challenge, right? Because it's just, it's you, but more refined and with maybe some of the idiosyncrasies filed down a little bit. Like, I, I imagine acting like yourself has got to be a little bit like acting drunk or acting 
despondent or something, you know? Mm -hmm. I will say I had a very gentle chuckle when Chris Ryan, the character, says, I'm not normally someone who likes to give advice, says the author who wrote, you know, a book. And also has a podcast where people write into him and he definitely gives advice. He calls it uh, Romas and Tomas ranting out my ass or talking out my ass. And it's him uh, reviewing uh, oftentimes uh, fan emails and giving advice. So the real Chris Ryan does give advice. In character, he does not like it. It's a burden. I mean, he's he's not here to impose his worldview on anyone. He is merely presenting it. And he's, I expected him to be a little bit more tut-tut condescending, but he's he's very gentle with her. He's so warm. He is so warm and so authentic in how he empathizes and connects with India. Chris Ryan brags about his AVN award all the time. And I think it was well-earned. I think he really crushed it right here in this scene. We have Eric to be kind of the cold pool to Chris Ryan's hot tub, you know? I feel like Eric is doing a lot of the work of the bad acting so that the good acting stands out. So, I mean, I hope, <laughs> I hope that when Chris Ryan accepted that award, he gave a little nod to Ryan Driller, who played Eric, for being absolutely flat and cardboard. Yeah, well, now that we're, now that we're, personal enemies with Ryan Driller uh, I'll, I'll mention that uh, I'll mention that uh, I, I sort of elided over the part in my notes where I talk about him being a little waxy in the argument scene with India and uh, yeah Chris Ryan is that hot tub Ryan Driller is the ice bucket challenge um, moving on I liked the little montage of India being distracted at work because you see her interacting with some truly tedious people. She's, like, going through a relationship meltdown and someone wants to discuss the holiday party. And <laughs> <laughs> It was some uh, welcome levity as well. As well as welcome characterization for India. Like, she's a professional. You see her in her professional capacity at work in her little cubicle. And you get a sense of how driven she is. After that begins a sequence that I think really illustrates the premise of the movie. What India goes through after this point is her actually exploring for herself the concepts that have been introduced to her throughout the movie. Like, she finally starts to question monogamy on her own terms rather than Eric's terms. And we cut to an interaction with a couple. Maybe you can describe it. That couple, Megan and Edward, they are the hosts of the swingers party. And India talks with them. And they actually mentioned that Chris Ryan received an invitation to be at that party, but was out of town. Uh, India asks Megan and Edward how they make polyamory work. And they tell her it takes radical honesty and communication and that all couples have their worries from time to time. It's certainly nothing unique to polyamory. And so this is nice. I mean, India is getting the message that uh, I really wish that her and Eric had both gotten to begin with, which is just communicate more directly about what's going on in, in their relationship and what their respective needs are. Because India uh, has taken her mom's advice and does want to be more open to exploring polyamory and not merely to please Eric, but to please herself, does take Edward home. And Edward tells her that he likes the way she loves Eric, that he's noticed it. He's noticed that their love seems deep and enduring. Uh, it, it did strike me a little bit because he's only recently met both of them, uh, India and Eric, but... Nevertheless, like I was sort of touched by this, Edward basically just says, your relationship is so real and so enduring that I picked up on it right away and don't lose sight of or take for granted what you two have here because it has a actually pretty strong foundation, any problems that they're having aside. Edward the Sage Beardo. Yeah, he, um, I really wish that the version of their relationship that Edward describes was ever in evidence on the screen, because I really enjoy his character. He's very compassionate and insightful, and right. like, he makes a lot of observations that they're not reflected in what we see of India and Eric. They're not evident on the screen, because up until now, Eric seems like kind of an asshole. He's very selfish, and we see some physical love between them, but we I never ever get the sense of any like true 
emotional, spiritual, romantic love of any description. And that is sad. I mean, uh, to the extent that there is a deeper foundation there, it is something that Edward observes, uh, but we don't get to observe. Also, Edward mentions to India that he had a side conversation with Eric at the party where Eric was telling him about the relationship. That's all off screen too. So whatever Eric said to Edward to give him a sense of this relationship being like deep and loving, it's hidden from us as an audience. And it's just too unfortunate because this scene, it does have some poignancy. I personally connected with him saying, don't take what you have for granted. Like there is a depth here. And yet it's, it feels cheap at the same time because it's not on display for us. It's just off screen. In any case, India and Edward go on a date. They go on a series of dates. They go on like a marathon. India and Edward go on a marathon date. They go to the movies, they go to a jazz bar, they party with their friends. They have a regular old night. I have to just cut in and say something about the jazz bar. I mentioned earlier that there are sequences of the movie where there's absolute silence. The weirdest of this is seeing a jazz performance at a jazz bar and it's completely silent. There is a performer on the stage for an extended period of time singing and we hear no music, no voice, no sound effects. It's just silent. At a part of the movie where it's supposed to be a happier part of the movie, it's the last act of the movie, we're turning a new leaf, India is enjoying herself and finding what she wants in life, and it's just silent during this entire jazz bar scene. So here's my theory. This I'm going to go back to the theory that I had. Uh, <gasps> the here, theory. Here is my theory about why there are these long, silent sequences for no apparent reason in the movie. I believe that they didn't get the rights to the jazz. I think that they filmed the jazz bar performance thinking that they were going to be able to use the audio and they either couldn't afford it, somebody held out for more money, or the, the rights, some legal maneuvering with the rights just fell through. And so they had a scene in post-production, all the filming's done. I believe, this is my theory, I can't prove it, but I believe that they had a scene that they couldn't use the audio of, but they couldn't reshoot either. So the I believe that the only thing that the director could do was add long stretches of silences throughout the rest of the movie to make it match. Because there is no rational explanation why you would have a jazz number in a movie and it's completely silent. I would love to see, I because I think you're absolutely right, I would love to see the version of this film with the music that they were unable to get the licensing for. Allegedly. And we can't prove it. No, we can't. Don't quote us on this, please. But I think you're right, and I would be interested to see the original version as envisioned, uh, assuming you're right, as envisioned by the director. As per their marathon date, they're not tired of each other yet. They decide to go see an adult film together in an adult movie theater. Did you notice the Ticketmaster at the adult movie theater is played by the same actor who plays the waitress during the tedious West Coast accent lunch scene? No, because I was so riveted by how much that scene annoyed me. <laughs> I think... So, I, this is another thing I can't really... It, it would be hard for me to prove, but I believe that whoever this person is, is somebody that the viewer is meant to know. I think like much in the way that Carol Queen plays the nosy neighbor, Miss Peters, who just has the cameo of barging in uh, periodically on uh, on Eric and India when they're having sex. I think that this person, whoever this is, and, and I don't, I didn't find her in the credits, whoever it is, I think that she's someone we're meant to know. Because back during the lunch scene, it kind of makes a thing about like the waitress taking the order in a way that like highlights it. Whoa. And I was like, oh, like who is this supposed to be? Like why do they why does the you know the camera and the amount of like the change of pace when it happens, like it just seemed like we're supposed to know who this is. And then whoever this is comes back in as the ticket master. Like she's got these two jobs and we see her twice in these little cameos. I think we're supposed to know who this is. I don't know who this is, but uh I think maybe like Carol Queen, maybe she's a sexologist, maybe she's someone involved in polyamory research or commentary or human sexuality in general. Um, I think she I think it's like a Carol Queen situation here. Can I just say whenever you say sexologist or when anyone says sexologist, 
and I know that this is a real thing. I'm not making fun of sexology. My brain always goes to like sexmancer or something. Like I, I these it seems like someone who could like conjure sex from <laughs> an arcane source or perhaps a mad science source. Like they've got sex on a slab with like Frankenstein's monster bolts on its neck, and they're they're like you know bringing they're they're giving sex life in a in the middle of a, a thunderstorm. That's my helpful take on sexology and sex, sexomancy. Yeah, I think of it more as like a paleontology thing, like the sexologist is out there in the dirt, like panning for the sex, like hoping to find that that sex fossil that they need <laughs> to make their sexy case for their sexy dissertation. The missing bone. Oh, the film that they go and see is, I, I couldn't help but notice, um, do you know anything about the film? Is it an actual film, or do you think it's something that they created for this movie, for these people to be watching? Because they're they're in the adult theater, they end up there alone, and India falls asleep on Edward's shoulder while, you know, there's some artful dancing around with scarves on the screen and uh just the, the stylistically the film on the screen reminded me a lot of marriage 2.0 the film on my screen um do you have any insight into that do you did you get the same sense or yeah i did get the same sense uh, the other thing that gave me the same sense was we do see some of the credits for the film that they are watching whatever it is and the director paul deeb is credited in oh. that mini film so i do think that it is a paul deeb Deeb uh, production. Paul Deeb, with a name like Deeb, you know, it's got to be porn. <laughs> well, good good eyes on that. Um, I did not catch the credits bit, but stylistically, it had Deebs all over it. it so. <laughs> there were some Deeb cuts. <laughs> oh, I could riff on that name all day. It's a great name. Paul Deeb, if you're listening, your name is great. It's beautiful. You should feel good about it. India wakes up at the movie theater. Edward's like, oh, you were out there because she had fallen asleep. But then the next scene, India and Edward do go home. They start hooking up. They don't have intercourse, but they're hooking up on the stairwell, on India's stairwell. And uh, they pay off the Mrs. Peter's nosy neighbor thing because uh, Carol Queen comes back. It's again played for humor. She bumps into Edward and India and she's all like, oh, well, who is this about Edward? Because she sees them hooking up and it's not Eric. So India is now out as somebody that uh, is having polyamorous relationships uh, to somebody who wasn't aware of that. Mrs. Peter is her nosy neighbor. She is pretty down with it, though. Her attitude is basically just like, oh, well, you kids have fun. Like, <laughs> Well, I mean, she's also doing it for voyeuristic reasons. Like she keeps oh, anytime she it. hears. Yeah, she wants she wants to bump into them. And so she's going to be lighthearted about it because this is how this is. Mrs. Peters is is into this scenario happening again and again. Thing that she apparently lives in like swinger central like she <laughs> she must have just searched san francisco exhaustively for swinger sign and then finally like she triangulated the maximum number of swingers <laughs> around her and she kind of just parked herself right there because she she is she has a knack for walking in on swinger swinging so like does she live in this stairwell we don't get to really see any other apartments or condos here like she we, we just know she barges directly into the kitchen at the beginning of the film and then she's just there in the stairwell when when they're when india and edward are hooking up i don't i mean maybe she lives in the stairwell maybe she did the craigslist search for san francisco stairwells where she could just wait and the acoustics are probably good to overhear sex and barge in on whoever's doing it this is mrs peter's bag you know what good for her Good for her. Uh, kind of like India's mom, Mrs. Peters, she really seems like she's figured out what she wants, and she she's she's looking after her. Right. As long as the people that she's barging in on are into it, like I don't like I don't want her barging into my place. Like personally, I prefer she not. You can do barge that. into my place, Mrs. Peters. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I think you're going to get to know her real well. She's Googling uh, Seattle stairwells as we speak. Yeah. Buzz me when you get here, Miss Peters. But. Uh, the encounter between Edward and India stops there. He's got to go... His his son has a soccer game in the morning. He's got to go be dad. 
And she's like, are you serious? Like they went on date after date after date. Um, I should mention this was all predicated by Edward telling her at the outset, like, oh, are we going to, are we going to have sex now? Or are we going to go on a bunch of dates and then have sex? And she's like, well, let's go on a bunch of dates. And then, and then, and now, <laughs> and now she's, she's, she invites him in, got interrupted by Mrs. Peters. And he's all like, oh, uh, by the way, he only tells her now. He doesn't say like, oh, hey, I'm on a short, I'm on a time limit here. Like my kids got soccer in the morning. Right. Only, only when she invites him in, he's like, oh, about that. Yeah, no, I can't. I, you know, I got my kids got soccer. Like, <laughs> no, nah, I can't be doing this. And she and India actually says like pretty much the same thing that I said at the screen was she goes, are you serious? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, sorry. So she, so he's out. Edward was, he, he's kind of like the manic pixie dream polyamorous spouse of the film because he kind of just shows up to like give India this little liberating teachable moment and then he's out. He's gone. He's got other things to do. Like, it's very clear they are not going to, at least uh, I read it as they are probably not going to see each other in this way again. He just, right. he was an agent of her own kind of self discovery self-liberation he was there to like help her understand something about herself that she had independently gone looking for so i love edward i missed him when he was gone i wanted like i think that uh he should have probably been cast as eric honestly yes. like the actor just brings it so much harder in the personality department insofar as he has one so bye edward I can't wait for the angry Ryan Driller tweets at, at our podcast. We have made an enemy this day. <laughs> I'd like to see you do better, huh? He's going to hate us, but it's all good. No, Ryan Driller, don't hate us. You don't even know us. True. I mean, I guess it would be a good problem to have. Like, if he actually hears this, it means people are listening. Stretch goals. Make a uh, Ryan Diller. Oh my god, no Google. I'm sorry. Google just woke up in my phone and it, it wants to talk about Ryan Driller with me now. <laughs> Drill bits are sold at Home Depot. Uh, podcast goal, make Ryan Driller angry. Not really. Uh, like, how do we know he doesn't have, like, I don't, I mean, how do we know there's not, like, a Ryan Driller mafia out there? Like, what if he's just got these, like, just hardcore fans that just go to bat they just oh, that's stand the drill bits it's driller it's <laughs> and driller his and his drill bits <laughs> yeah uh, damn jim we messed with the wrong crew like we are in over our heads i'm yeah i mean there, it's too late now it's already out there i mean it is a good problem to have like if, if he's mad at us it's because someone was listening so so therefore he'll never get mad at us like people don't listen to this do they we are we are bulletproof come at me drill bits prove me wrong <laughs> so how does this film end? What happens? The film abruptly comes to a close. We see India on a beach. She reunites with Eric. They apologize to each other for the fight. India says she wants them both to have it all, but she's protective of the relationship. They both say they don't really know where the relationship will take them, but whatever direction they're going, they're going to go there together. The end. Overall impressions of the film. really sad that she ended up with Eric. Like, I was hoping it was going to be a thing where, like, she went off and had a bunch of totally different relationships that were founded in her new understanding of herself instead of going back. Like, I didn't want her to go back to Eric. I wanted them to maybe have sort of a moment later where she is with other people for her own reasons and she sees that he's with other people, obviously for his own reasons. And I wanted, like, you know, just a respectful nod between them. But them getting back together, that really bothered me. Um, mostly because Eric, it seems like Eric essentially gets to keep behaving the way that he wants. And India had to do the work to come around to his position. And as much as I, like, I feel like she did more or less undergo a credible change of perspective on herself... I don't think she underwent a credible change of perspective on her relationship because she is objectively in a relationship with a selfish asshole. So I couldn't get behind the resolution. I liked the themes, but I wish that they had let the movie's point of view be a little more subtle. Like, you know, I, I have to take your word for it, but from listening to you, it sounds like a lot of the arguments made, not arguments, but 
a lot of the, the swingers and pro uh, swinging polyamory people, and I'm not conflating those two, I know that sometimes they are different things to different people, but some of the swingers and some of the polyamorous people are just pulling lines from the book Sex at Dawn, and I wish that the message of the film had been a little more subtle. Yeah, I totally agree. Eric is hard to like. His characterization goes from not being very much to him coming off as just very self-absorbed. Um, not really thrilled about about the plot and characterization of this movie. Not really thrilled about where it ends up. I think Sex at Dawn is a great book, uh, and I and I don't think the film does it justice. But it was very fun to see Chris Ryan in the movie and, and other people. I mean, Carol Queen is cool too. Like, it's glad I'm glad that she was in there. It's nice that the movie had those little cameos. It's the best thing about it. But uh, no, I didn't like the film. In this genre of film, just broadly adult films, there are some harrowing entries. There are some feature length films that, for example, we will not talk about. Uh, there are some feature length films that we're going to talk about or that we have talked about that contain some pretty troubling things. And I will say that this film was very contemporary in that Obviously, other than the inherent problem of a difference in understanding of a non-monogamous relationship, other than that, I did not feel like anyone's consent was violated. I felt like everyone in the movie was having a very open and spirited conversation about one, you know, a, a person's own sexual wellness, taking care of oneself, one's needs, one's wants. And that is, compared to other films in this adult genre of film, it was refreshing. It was refreshing in a way that some films are definitely not. So I will say that it was very 2015 in its sensibilities. And that's nice. In, in a type of film that can be very, like, exploitative and maybe even, you know, seemingly kind of harmful to its participants, this, this, I did not get that sense from this film, and I appreciated that. So what we've decided is that uh, as these are adult films that we are reviewing, we will pick out for every film uh, a helping hand. Ah, uh, yes. And that refers to the most helpful person, the most giving, generous, perhaps warm person, depending on the circumstances, in the film. So did you find yourself a helping hand? I did find a helping hand, and uh, his name was Edward. There were a lot of compassionate people in the film, but Edward was just there to, like, go on some dates and kind of let India figure herself out. And just like the manic pixie dream swinger that he is, he kind of left at the exact right moment uh, so that she could kind of ruminate on what she had experienced with him. And uh, he was just, he was very warm. He was very gentle. Edward's my man. I'm all about Edward. How about you? Um, I did find one. I found India's mom. I think that it's a given in this movie. It's pretty much openly stated that India doesn't quite have the clarity about what she wants in life uh, or in, in her relationship life um, or or at least has trouble communicating those wants. And India's mom had a heart to heart with her, really opened up, showed more vulnerability in the film uh, than India ever really did. And in doing so, got India to resolve to try new things, to go to the swingers party, to get set on what she wants out of her relationship, uh, if anything, out of that relationship. And, uh, you know, we've both said that we're not thrilled about this couple as a couple, but nevertheless, uh, India's mom just, you know, you want to have a mom that will sit on the back porch and drink mimosas with you and help straighten out your life. And so India's mom uh, was the helping hand in that regard. Yeah. I mean, as a person has two hands, I think a film can have two helping hands. And <laughs> uh, I think India's mom is another great entry. And now I am sort of head cannoning India's mom hanging out with Edward. And I think they would have a fantastic time. They would go to that jazz bar and they would actually hear the music. There you have it. That has been an episode of Feature Bang. It's a Feature Bang. We'll see you next time. The best way to support Feature Bang is to like, subscribe to, and share our content across social media platforms. We'd like to thank Eva Lynn for providing Feature Bang's music. You can find her experimental and electronic tracks on SoundCloud under the name Even, spelt E-V-Y-N-N-3, and alternative hip-hop under Cycle of Hands. <laughs>